Hello. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? So as we are joining the class, um, please take a look at Canvas. And we are going to go over the next unit, assignment and notes. I'm good, thank you. <laughs> nice to have a long weekend. <laughs> Let me make sure my microphone is working. Okay, so we are logging in on Canvas. Please take a look at your notes and your assignment for today. We're gonna go over those documents together. And let's wait about three minutes for the rest of the class to join and then we'll start, okay? So this week we are going to program an assembly, OC3. And we talked about getting ready, downloading your application for the simulator. And then um, I corrected the document last night or early this morning. And so I, I'll explain the lab on Thursday, but today we are gonna look at the assignment and the notes. Okay, welcome back. I hope you're doing good for those of you who just got into Zoom. <clears throat> so please look at your notes. And we are gonna go over the chapter three notes, and then we're gonna revisit some of the concept from last time where we talked about gates. Okay. Let me stop share real quick. Let me get my file open shortly. We'll start in a minute. Okay, so as we go through the assignment together, um, I have everybody on mute. So if you have questions, you can type it into the chat or comments. Um, you can also unmute and ask. Just keep in mind that I'm recording the session and I will release it on YouTube tonight um, and then link it back onto Canvas page. So it will be available with the assignment page and also the video page in unit two, okay? And so you can always go back and watch it in case you miss anything um, or if you just wanna review. All right, any question before we start? Well, I hope you had an enjoyable weekend. Uh, it was a long weekend and um, I was able to catch up with a little bit of work, but we are here today to learn about um, we're going to talk about the processor itself, and as we progress in this class, we are going to learn a little bit more about low-level programming along with the construction and the architecture um, of your CPU, your microprocessor. Um, just some quick announcements. So I posted a few things for those of you who have me for winter. You probably have seen some of the, the information, but um, I have a couple opportunities that we'll be able to give you a little bit of money and also some um, experience. So the first one is in data science. 
Um, if you're interested in this and you don't have to make up your mind now about data science, you want to find out what it is. Um, this summer, you can earn a stipend, $5,000. And also, um, there's a company that's able to fund low-income students that qualify for this program with another $10,000. So altogether, $15,000 for the 12 week, which is great. Um, so we want you to be able to participate in the UCR data science path. Um, basically, it is a fellowship for the summer. And if you like data science, you can further pursue the transfer pathway. Um, we don't have an ADT uh, associate degree yet. It should be available next fall, um, not this fall, but 2023. And so you can take classes that will be transferable to UCR, UC Berkeley, UC Davis, UCI, um, and UC San Diego. Uh, I've been working with the articulation for a while now and I have submitted the course and the associate degree along with the data analytics certificate um, for data science. So um, while you're doing the associate degree, you can also earn the certificate because the associate degree simply just have two more math courses, which is Calculus 1C, along with, um, I believe, the algebra course. Um, so check out this flyer. I do have an info session with UCR, R RCC, and Norco. We, this is a joint task um, for Friday, March 4th, and it's gonna be between 11, and it's gonna go until one. We will have actual data scientists um, speaking at the event, so you can ask questions about the field, um, what kind of experience and education they're looking for. So the info session live will be here, um, and then we'll hold another one in May. If you are interested in the fellowship, you can use this QR or the link to apply, and the application is submitted to UCR. Um, RCCD faculty can actually see it as well. But if you're interested in the fellowship right now, you can apply there, okay? And then um, once you are approved, you will receive an email and an invitation. It is virtual and on campus at UCR. Um, so it is like a hybrid format where they will, they will require you to come to campus for various research um, stuff. They do really cool things over there. So if you're interested, check that out. The second opportunity I want to show you is um, one of the projects that I'm currently working on. I am a primary um, researcher for, for NSF for this particular program, which is called STEM. Um, as you are studying computer science, engineering, or other STEM-related areas, you can apply for this and make sure that you check out the qualification, right? And it's really aimed to help low-income students that's high performing. Um, we are looking to fund a total of 60 students, 30 students in the first um, two to three years, and then subsequent year it's going to be an additional 15 added as some of the student will be transferring or exiting the program. You can apply for that here using this QR code or the link. Or if you have questions, um, I do have live office hours on various Friday particular for this. And then you can also contact me or Adam or Esteban Navas. Dr. Navas and I are um, participating in this particular project. So um, we're hoping to give you some money and be able to help you address some of the issues on how you can be more engaged and successful in the STEM program. Okay, any questions? All right, so next we are going to look at unit two. And just to give you a preview, um, unit two is going to be assignment and lab only. We're not going to have a quiz until later on. So there will be a homework assignment next week. So you can prepare for the quiz in the following week. Um, I plan not to give you too much work during spring break. So we're going to try to coordinate some of the exercises as we go along and then catch up if we need to. OK, all right. So now let's take a look at your notes. So last week, we finish up with the number systems looking at binary, hexadecimal, decimal, oct octal. Um, and you are going to apply those concepts throughout the class. 
this week we are going to look at on the concept size, right? On the on on the actual uh, textbook um, and the chapter, it talks about processor, um, and then looking at the components with the processor, and then we are going to do a lab where you would learn how to do input and output um, using assembly language, which is a little bit different than what you have seen in other languages. So. Coming back to what we talked about last time, we talked about gates and gates are constructed with, by, by using transistors. And we looked at what the transistors would look like, okay? They would look something like this, could be various sizes. And inside the housing of your microprocessor, if you're looking at like the Intel i9 or even your smartphones, right? you would see that there are circuits or digital circuits that is constructed by using transistors and components to be able to give you right, the computing um, that you would require today. So if we're looking at the number of transistors that's incorporated in the processor, it has changed over time. Um, and I included the link on your notes and it's gonna take you to the Wikipedia page. And I found that this gives you an overall picture best, okay? So if we're looking at the 1970s, that's when the development initially will really transform how we look at computing for consumer. Um, we originally use uh, a lot, you know, computing power just for a lot of research, government-based, but in the 70s is when we transition to really implement this for consumer base. So you would have various companies that produce microprocessor. So when we're looking at the, the MOS transistor, we would see that the number were in the low thousands. This is probably from the beginning of 70s to maybe late 70s. And then in the 80s is when you start seeing the explosion of dot-com. Uh, people started to be able to access a little bit of the web using modem. And communication has changed the way we look at computing systems. And so therefore, you would see that there's a tremendous increase in the number of transistors that's incorporated in the microprocessor. So for example, if you're looking at you know, the, the Intel base, Right, we went from the low thousand a decade later to maybe 50,000 or even higher than that, depending on the need for that type of processor. So you might have servers that will require more and you would have smaller system like computing system for PC user that will be less. Then transition to the 90s, we would start seeing technology being used for other purposes like your game consoles um, and a lot of other area that would be beyond what we have seen in the 70s and 80s. So entering the smartphone eras, you would see that transistor, had, the number of transistor had gone from maybe 100,000 to a million or more, right? So if you're looking at Pentium base, right, 3 million. If you're looking at ARM architecture, which are often used in IoT devices and smart devices, transitioning that over to also the 2000s, we see a tremendous increase in the use of transistors as our computing need has changed. So the next time that you buy your processor, right, we often think about what is the speed of the processor, and we often look at the, the cache and, and you will see pretty soon when you start programming an assembly why cache is so important. Okay, so for a quick example, here's an i9 set. And you know that Intel i9, they're not made to be all equal, they're different. So when you're looking at the processor, this is the baseline benchmark speed. Give or take, you are going to look at about five gigahertz for, for the 12th generation, okay? Now, the size of cache is indicated here, and cache is mainly used for temporary memory. And so the processor quickly store, right, um, some of the 
values and also instructions that we give it at the low level in order to compute or process the task. So when you are using your registers this week, think about the temporary storage. And temporary doesn't mean that the data is always gonna be retained there. So it will quickly transition that to the memory. So this size of the cache is decent. So when I was building computers back in the 90s, it was a lot lower than this. So when you're looking to buy a processor to build your computer, whether for gaming or school, right? You want to think about what is the processor speed that's in the frequency that's gigahertz. So the higher this is, right? The faster it's gonna be able to compute or process all the instructions. Also the larger the size cache is gonna give us a lot more storage compared to what we've seen before. So going from this model of an i9 and in the same family, right? You see that there's less cache here, but about the same speed. So when you're looking at the later generation i9, it's gonna be roughly about five gigahertz compared to what you've seen in some of the i7, earlier i7, it's gonna be about roughly four gigahertz. So it has increased quite a bit. And this is really gonna drive the consumer market um, you know, to based on what we we utilize the processor for. Okay, so you can take a look at that. And now that when you shop for a processor like AMD or Intel, you will be able to see. Now, if you search for AMD, they're, you know, um, a little different in how the socket is used or how it's, it's installed physically, how it's designed. Um, the cores are used differently. Okay, and so we'll touch on, you know, multitasking and stuff down the line when we'll look at that at low level. And then, you know, the speed is gonna be roughly close to this or sometime even better. And AMDs tend to be a little cheaper um, depending on the model as well, okay? And then we also have integrated, right, technology with graphics. So that way, you know, in the case where you don't have an additional um, video adapter, you are able to utilize like the either the onboard or incorporated with the processor itself. So it was only available for water cooling last summer. Yeah, I think that because the the speed and you know with the speed you are going to see a little bit of heat issues. So with the heat. Um, you have to cool it and the computer is happier when it's in a lower temperature, right? In the 60s or even lower. Um, so you want to be able to cool it and water cool system is gonna give you a lower overall temperature all the way around for the health of your system. So the often that if you're running hot on the tower or in the system, even on your laptop, right? Your computer will often restart and things like that. So. If you're interested in doing maintenance and computer repair, uh, we do offer CS25 this semester. I sometimes teach that class because I love hardware in general. So any other comment or questions? Okay. Um, it's always a good experience to build your computer or be able to put together a package and you know, it's, it's a good learning experience overall. All right. So at the beginning of the notes, it talks about the design and the scale on how transistor is used. And coming back to what we talked about with the circuit, so this gives you like an overall generic example of what a circuit would be. So at home, when you're plugging in your devices or turning on your light, you're using a circuit. So the electrical circuit would be something like this. Now, um, the computer, your computer is being, the power of it is being supplied, right? From, right, your household and, and then your power supply would take that and be able to distribute the power to the rest of all your components, including your processor. So in general, your processor is gonna require approximately 90 to 120 watts compare. And then um, the, the volts, that's being used for other components like your hard drive, if it's not, you know, if it's not an SSD um, or your video adapter and so on is also being distributed by the power supply. 
So we would connect that and the power supply would then distribute that to all the components. So we would use input and output components to be able to be able to have what we see as a computing system. All right, so now in figure 3.1 and 3.2, right, it shows you how the circuit is being used on the gates level, okay? And here they're using a battery. Uh, so you would see that with the less volts just to power a lamp or a light. And it shows you how the drain and the source. So you would then, and gates are used as logical gates, right? And or not, and not nor. So what you would see is we would apply the logical or the digital circuits to your logical gates to be able to have what we would see as input and output or instructions overall. Now, in the next part, it defines what metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor would be your MOSFET. So if you are, you, if you have built the computer before and if you are able to, to uh, look at some of the hardware components, right? You often hear the term CMOS or MOS. So in an older technology that will be metal oxide semiconductor transistors and in the architecture that we're learning, which is the ISA, it uses P-type and N-type, okay? So these are the type of transistors. What it would be is think of it like a, a layer type of semiconductor. And all of your computer components, including your video adapter, right? And some of the hard drives, you see the, 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 the blue green or the green boards or even motherboard, right? That is being incorporated what we would see with the wafers or crystal of silicone, right? So silicone dioxide is then being on the other layer. So it's gonna sandwich between the crystal of the silicone and the silicone dioxide with metal in order to give you what you see as transistors tends to term Silicon Valley, right? That's where all the tech companies would be producing from the 80s. And these layers allow you to have what's called a substrate. So we find that silicon dioxide is a good insulator. It is very thin. And so that way we're able to incorporate these layers as part of the hardware in what you see in all your components, okay? Any questions? Now for the transistor that we don't use metals, right? Um, it would then use the, the polycrystalline silicone. So virtually all of the devices, um, when you look at, they would have metal traces, but then there's some that don't have metal components then it would use the polysilicone, okay? And a diagram of this would look like this. So when you get into engineering, right, you would learn more on the digital circuits, how to really design chipsets, chipset, chip, like microprocessor. So big thing that you need to remember for final and quiz is that beyond the physical look of a transistor, the components or the three regions of your transistor include source, gate, and drain, okay? And so with the substrate material, what you would see is that the semiconductor material, the insulating and the layer that's insulating the actual processor, right, and the upper, metal layer is part of the gate region. So for the drain and the source region, they are um, the, you know, dope with different materials. So that way it would be constructed to exist for the drain in the MOSFET, okay? 
Now, often you would see that they would use metal like gold because gold doesn't rust quickly, right? Uh, rust level on gold is a lot less than what you would see with silver or copper. So this is why company recycle parts, right? Computer parts, so that way they can melt it out to use the metal that was incorporated in your computer components. Okay, and when you look at the source in the drain region, right? Here's the P-type and here's the N-type. They look the same, but on the P-type, that wouldn't be including the metal. Okay, so now we would come to the logic gates. In the logic gates, it would operate the logical functions, right? And when we program, we give it the logical functionality. We tell it that, right, to operate the, our instructions with a specific logic. So these are the fundamental blocks of your, what's called the integrated circuits. And when we learned binary last week, that's really on the low level how data, right, is really stored and transferred across. So we would also look, we looked at and or not, exclusive or not and not or, right? And not exclusive, uh, not exclusive or. So on the level of the construction of your processor, the maximum number of their logic gates in an integrated circuit is really determined by the size of the chip divided by the logic gates, okay? So when we looked at your transistor number earlier, So Sarah put that silver has other issues, right? High sulfur environment, backup batteries, control. Yeah, I agree. Um, and as we're looking at sources to really, um, you know, expand in the growth of how computing components is, is being utilized, okay? Then we would see how we can transition from different type of material, but primarily we're gonna see silicone based or wafer, and then um, with your semiconductor, and then you would see metal components. I don't think we can move completely away from a lot of these metals, right? Um, primarily gold, but overall, you would see that, you know, uh, maybe down the line, we would use something that's beyond what we've seen until now. So the tech take away from this is what I bolded here. Your integrated circuits, right, for your chip, would be the size of your chip divided by the size of your logic gates. So in the smaller transistor, that just means that more complex and how we would be able to derive the faster processor today. So let's answer some of the questions now in your assignment, okay? So for question number one, it asks you to describe the function of a transistor in your microprocessor. And we can take some of the content from the chapter in the notes and we can say that your CPU control processing unit is gonna be an integrated circuit that consists of transistors, diodes, capacitors, resistors. And these can be, they are physical components of your processor. And in some cases, it also has an inductor. And what transistors are, they are logic gates, which are used as flip-flops or switches. And gates are used to make combination circuits, while flip-flops are used to make sequential circuits. I have a typo here. So then they're used to make different building blocks in your microprocessor, such as arithmetic logic unit. And we'll look at 
you know, what are the units based on von Neumann model and other components. And some boards, you would see that there will be chipsets, right? There will be smaller chips that would like your motherboard, okay? And each of the chip has different functionality. So when one would open up your a smartphone, right? You would see that your smartphone board would have a location where your main microprocessor would be. And then on the board itself, there would be different chips that would be in charge of different things. So for example, right? there would be a chip that would be in charge of amplifier. It uses to control, right, how the power is distributed across all your other area of the board. For example, to be able to power your microphone, to be able to power your screen and so on. And so on the complex level, when we're looking at your motherboard, right, it is a group of chips that's used for different, to control different devices uh, that's attached to it. Any questions? And like I said, you don't have to put exact verbatim, but your assignments are your notes as well, right? Um, so this is gonna help you understand a little bit more on what you're using, what you're learning, in computer science. Now, if you're familiar with Arduino, sometimes we would be able to use resistors and resistors are used to control flows of your electrical signal. So we can use resistors to, to have resistance. So we can reduce because Electrical signal are not constant, right? Sometimes higher and lower. So what we want is we want to be able to control where it would be regulated. So we can regulate it using resistors. Questions? Okay, so I'm gonna scroll down a little more. So we can go over the next question. Now the three states of switch base circuits that will be on or off, what we would see as on as one and off as zero. And when we're looking at this in a gate, perspective, we would see that would be open or closed. So that also means on electrical level that will be applying five volts for when it's on or close to zero volts or no volts when it's off. So when we say a one, which is on, that will be open, it's gonna give five volts. When it's off, your gates will be closed. So at the switch level, that will be closed and your it will reduce down to zero volts. So these are states and we will talk about the state machine. So as we understand this, we're going to break it down from the simplest, right, the most basic concept, and we're going to build it up. And now you would see it from a perspective where that will be internally inside, your, inside the processor, how it understands instruction, how it store, right, what are the components, and how digital circuits are integrated to give you the PC. So earlier, I briefly mentioned that there are two types of your MOS transistors, your N-type and your P-type. Make sure we know this for quiz and test. In the N-type, 
when the gate has positive voltage, it will have a short circuit between your terminal one and two, which makes it closed. Because earlier we talked about how that would be a closed circuit. But when it has zero voltage, when it's off, the circuit is open between terminal one and two, okay? And that will make it a zero or it's open. Now, when it has zero voltage, it would then be attached to what we know as ground, G and B stands for ground. That's how it's able to pull out the voltage or pull down the voltage when the input is one. Okay, so even when your input is one, it would then use the ground in order to pull that down to a voltage. So in the case where we're using and, anytime that you have a zero that's introduced in, in the input, you would have to have a pull down. So that will be a zero. Okay, so that means that that circuit is then it's gonna need to open between terminal one and two. So, and use ground to be able to pull down the signal or the voltage. And that only explains what we see with the N type, okay? In the P type, it is the complementary of the end type. So when you hear the word complementary in this class, you know, right? It's to be the opposite. So unlike the end type, when you have the gate that's positive voltage, or when we have a one, your circuit, it's gonna open between terminal one and two instead of close. So P is the opposite of N. Now, when it has a zero voltage, it's gonna short circuit between terminal one and two, causing it to close. So in this case, it's gonna attach the positive voltage and it's gonna pull up. So it's gonna pull the output voltage up when you have an input that is zero and you see this for the OR. Anytime that you have a one, you have a one as an output, right? Even when you have a zero, okay? So as the other input. So what you would have is it's gonna need to pull up. And in this case, the switch is gonna close for the terminal. So the big difference is that the N type is the opposite of the P type. So if you remember the end type on how, what it would be at one or zero, then you should be able to know what the P type would be. And these are just the type of transistors that are used in the architecture. Any question? Professor, is this why um, wires are color coded like between black and, yeah. and white, like the ground wire and live? And, okay. Yeah, I think by standard and not all companies follow that specific standard, they try to standardize that. So when you look at your power supply or even electrical wire for home use, right? Positive tends to be red or brighter color. Ground is gray, black or brown um, to indicate, right? Um, color coding system helps us differentiate between, you know, positive voltage or positive, you know, uh, electrical signal compared to zero or negative. Okay, but in when when you're looking at circuits in general, right, on how it will be open and closed in certain cases, and when we're looking at these transistors, because these transistors are used for logic gates, they're designed to to open and close in a specific way. Okay.
other questions? So when we when we go into electrical engineering, right, we'll have to dive into a little bit more on ele electrical circuits, AC, DC. Okay. And if you miss something at the beginning, I can scroll up at the end when we catch up, okay? Uh, let me come back to the decoder. Let's continue with the assignment real quick, sorry. Oh. Okay. okay, so let's take a look at number four then. And so in when we're looking at voltage range, what are the voltage ranges for zero and one? And you can get more of this also on the publisher slides, okay? The publisher slides are, are, you know, that came with the textbook, so I uploaded it so you can also use it to study. Um, and when we're looking at what are the voltage ranges from zero and one in a digital logical structure, in a digital zero, it has analog value that ranges from zero to 0 0.5 volts. And so when you're looking at a digital zero, like zero, we talked about binary last week, like zero, you're gonna get close to zero volts, sometime not quite zero volts in analog. So things that are analog are like your, your sound is an analog, right? And your smartphone, it, it converts all of that to digital signal. So when you speak to the phone, your sound, your the voice that you're speaking, okay, that's in wave sound. So that will be analog. Your smartphone would take that and convert it into digital zero and ones. And when it sends that through the networks like T-Mobile, Verizon, at and that's all in digital format. And when it gets to the destination, so let's say that you speak to your friend right, who's on, on the other, on the line, right, <laughs> they say the line, um, and, and receiving your voice, hearing your voice on their smartphone, then their smartphone takes that digital signal and convert it back to analog and output it onto the speaker or what you would, that person would hear. So when you're making those, you know, recorded text messages, like a little video text messages, and you send it, right? All of that is happening from the time that you are recording to send, to receive, and then to, to be viewed. And the same thing when we're watching YouTube video, right? When we're hearing sound, when we're listening to music, everything that used the computing system that's happened. And we'll talk about encoding and decoding. For the digital one, it would have the analog value that ranges between 2.4 to 2.9 volts. And it would have a positive five volts value typically, or sometimes 3.3 volts or even 2.9 volts. So as you can see on the analog level, it's never exactly that value, it's always going to be approximate. So when the volts reach above 0 0.5, automatically the system should know that it is a one. When it's below 0 0.5 volts, that is the zero. So when you're working with Arduino, Oh, because in, in, in AMPS, also you, you would run into AMPS issues across uh, different regions and things like that to be able to really standardize it. So the way, and also components require different, uh, different volts and things like that. So just to give you a quick example, right? Um, if you're using microboards like Arduino and, and such, to really drive like a motor. So let's say you're building a drone and you want to make the blade 
spin. So you would use a motor. And to drive that motor, you would, it's going to be approximately 3.3 volts in that range. Okay. And as it's going to output that, it's going to not, it's, it's going to be in a range format, not exactly a specific value. To really, um, for the hard drive, if you're looking at all the spinning platter for the hard drive, that's, you know, any type of mechanical for the drives itself, along with, you know, just to power the drive to be able to to, to write that on the, the sector, that will be a, about 12 volts. So give or take, you are going to see that these, you know, drives are storing zero and ones along with, you know, when you're retrieving data, right, your processor uses zero and ones, so everything converts back to your digital, digital signal zero one binary. And if, if you're looking at like devices, like your smartphone have amplifier, right? Sometime it needs to increase that for, you know, different parts or different components in the smartphone. Sometime it would decrease that, uh, the, the, the range for other parts. So that's why that chip is also integrated. Now, I mentioned last week that we need to distinguish between your AND, your OR, and your NOT gates. You will see images like this on quiz and test, and you have to determine which one is which. Excuse me. So when we're looking at the logical AND in C++, that will be, right, your double ampersand. Oops, I typed three. And you in for the and we we mentioned that there will be two inputs, right? You have the input A and the input B. It requires two input. And how I usually distinguish, right, um, the the layout of this, your gates, the way it's drawn in the diagram, it looks like a D, and in the logical word and, right, you have a D, and that always helped me remember that this is the logical and. So it would take two input and it's going to yield one output, right? Depending on whether the A or the B has zero or one or both, right? And for the OR in C++, we would know that as a double pipe. Okay. And the OR also required to input. And it's going to yield one output. And the OR, <clears throat> the diagram, the shape of this look like an arrow. And you might see some other ways to draw the diagram, but this is the standard. So make sure that we know the difference, looking at the diagram. And then the knot. So the knot in C++, that will be your exclamation point. Now, depending on the syntax of the programming language, right? So when you work with C++, that's different than Python, because in Python, we just simply type in the word A and D. and then not an OT. So you just simply refer to the type of language syntax or the syntax for that language and be able to incorporate your logical op operators. So with the not, you will often see the little round bubble, okay? And in this diagram, we're using the sharp arrow with the ground bubble. So when you see this, you know that it's a not. So the not, unlike the other two, it's a unary operator. So it only requires one input, unlike the other two. 
and it's going to yield one output. And we use not a lot in this class because when we do subtraction, we have to do the two's complement. You flip the bits at the one. So we would not the value and then plus one. So when you apply the conditions, right, like in your statement, while, right, x is not this value, that, that operator that you incorporate as an exclamation point in C++, right, it, it would utilize this logical gate in your processor. And this class is going to piece all of the things that you've been learning in programming, and it's going to show you what the processor sees. Okay. Any question? Then for D, we learned that earlier we know what the or looks like, which is the arrow. And we just learned what a not look like, which is the little round bubble. So the not or or nor also requires two input because it's using or input A and input B. So you simply or and then you apply the second operator, which is not. And with that, you would have one output. And then for E, we learn what N looks like at the beginning with A. So here we have an N and also a not operator. So this we would this would be NAN or not N. So we would take those two input, we end them together, and then apply the not operator, and we would yield that output. And we practiced that last time, right? last week. Question on these? Okay, so now let's come back to the notes. In the next part, it talks about a decoder what a decoder is. So it is a circuit that converts your signal. Okay. And your decoder, the way it works is it reverses the encoding. Typical, you would see a line decoder. So it would take a certain number of digits in binary, and it would decode it into data lines. And with that, it would use the two table to be able to give you data. Okay, so in this example, a is an address, and when we say address, that's memory address. And D is the data line, okay? So D0 is really not A, as you see the not logical operator here, right? So it takes the, the address and it knots it. And then D1 is A. And this is what that circuit will look like. And in the lab, we will see more on how the address is used in hexadecimal. <clears throat> okay. So to draw out what, as a switch base, this is how it looks.
me change the view a little bit here real quick. Okay, next we're gonna talk about multiplexer. And multiplexer is a combinational logic circuit. So that means that it requires several input onto one common single output line. So when you do addition in binary, as I mentioned this already, you've seen this, okay? You've used it. You, when you punch in binary numbers or numbers to add, okay, like four plus nine, you're using it. So what happens is it's really sending one or more analog or digital signal over the line different times and, or different speed. It's really created to switch several input line through a single common input output line. Okay. Now, um, they often sometimes refer to it as channels, as you know, the time for the output because it's gonna be one, it's gonna combine all of those into one output. So when you see a MUX or the multiplexer, it can also, it is, right, in our case, the digital circuits for high speed logic gates. Okay. It is used for switch digital or binary data that can also be analog type. And all of these are all transistors, right? So in an example, the book refers to rotary switch. It will look something like this where you have different inputs, okay? And for the data selection, it's gonna switch across these inputs. And then it's gonna yield the output on one single data. Here, when it does this, it actually select the data. Okay, so that's why they call it data selector. So we do it this way, why, right? Because you don't want to have to add more, okay, logical gates for than necessary. You're able to use the same type. That's why we, we continue to use and or not, right? To be able to give you the combinations. So, in the case where if we're looking at your solid state drive, it's attached to your motherboard, it's at the, the channel, the bus, when we say the bus is where that could be the connection point between that hard, hardware along with your main board, right? So when, you, when you're storing data, okay, you're gonna have, let's say that I'm storing this document right now, you're still gonna have multiple inputs on that, okay? But then it's gonna pass it through the channel and it's gonna then dynamic like, right? So it's gonna pull the data as multiple inputs and then be able to give you on a one single common line. And the processor, it controls that on how data is transferred across to for input and output because the other components are just subpart, right, under the, the microprocessor. Now, it uses the control unit to be able to regulate that, but then it uses the arithmetic logical unit to make sure that the, your logical gates is functional, right, to, to have this, the switch base. 
Okay, so earlier I mentioned that when we add binary, we add values and the computer only adds, right? When we subtract, we add the two's complement. When we divide, we subtract multiple times. When we multiply, we add multiple times. So when you do a binary adder, it's really your arithmetic circuits. It has what's called, I have a typo here, what's called the full adder and the half adder. This is used for carry and also just to add values. So coming back to what we talked about earlier, your common national logic circuits really designed to do arithmetic, add binaries together. And that's what your computer does, which that's what your I-9 does, okay? And your AMD, Ryzen. So your adder circuits, it's a group of N and exclusive OR gates. And it becomes, when you combine these together, it becomes a MUX or a multiplexer. Okay. And so when we add them, it would come out to be a single binary number as an output, even when we have lots and lots of input. So when you add a one with the one, the sum of that is gonna be a zero with the carry one. When you carry it out, okay, it uses the adder bit to be able to operate that arithmetic. And so in the diagram, it shows you here, right? So let's say I have a four and a nine in decimal. That four converts to binary, nine converts to binary. It applies. So in the decimal, I know that I would have a carry, which is going to give me a three and a carry one. So when you have that, you would have a carry out. And it's going to bring that to the sum. Okay. And this is the exclusive OR gates. So the half adder is your logical circuit that's able to add two binary digits. It produce a sum and a carry value. That's your half adder. Okay, so when we look at to really add, we mainly use these gates for carry. Any question? Okay, now um, let's come back here. One second, I'm going to stop share short. Okay, let me pull my files. So in the next part, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to touch on De Morgan's Law. And you can also find the slides that I uploaded from chapter three. I don't really use the slides too much. I convert everything to one document, but you know some stuff on the slides are pretty decent. So here, it gives you a little bit more of your logical gates, um, you know, diagram on how it used the and the or gates along with the multiplexer and CMOS circuit. 
So in the De Morgan's law, you would then have to convert and or and to or. So we need to make the and to become the or. And at the gate level, you would see that it's going to not the, the both of the inputs and operate the and and then not it again to make it an or. OK. So it needs to invert both of the inputs, operate the and, the logical and, and then not it again to give you one output that's equivalent to an or. And that's how you can convert an and to an or. Okay. So the way that we can get to the or is to use the and and the not operators. So in simple English, <laughs> we're going to answer this question. Next question. Explain the De Morgan's law in relation to and, or, and not logic. And you don't have to put verbatim, of course, but I, I included it here so you can see. So the first theorem proves that when two input variables are and, and negated, which where we and and we not it, they are equivalent to the or of the complement of the in individual variables. So the equivalent of not and function will be the negative or or the complement or function. So when you do a not and, that will be a negative or. So alternately, when we have two variables that not or together, that will be the variables inverted and and. So in the second theorem, it states that two or more variables are NAND together that will be the same as the two terms inverted and OR. Okay, so it will be the complement and then OR. So we can then replace all the OR operators with the AND operators to give you the complement of the other logic. or all the AND operators with the OR operator to give the complement of the not OR, okay? Okay, so your NAND is your negative OR. And your NOR is the negative. Uh, yeah, your negative band. And that's the Morgan's Law. So let me put this up if you wanted the actual text. So as you can see, this law really apply how we're using combinational logical operators. You can have a combination of different logic to give you the equivalent of another logic. Question. Okay. So this class is a little bit different than your other classes that you can see. It has a lot of different components along with the programming, okay, concept-wise. And then we are gonna get into 
the specific language of assembly. But when you see it, how it's programmed, understanding this is going to have help you visualize on how right your data is converted and moved across inside the processor. I always say the assembly is very physical because you can actually visualize it, right? Okay. That's number six. Any question on the Morgans? And there will be many classes in CS that touches on this, right? In the extension of that particular class objective. So um, as you move to the upper division, you will revisit the, Morgan, the Morgan's law as it truly applied in the logic for computer science. Okay, so let's, um, we've seen something like this already, but let's do the NAN so we can see. Okay, let me find. I'm going to copy this and put it on one document. So I'm going to put it here so you can see. Oh, I don't want my Python code. <laughs> copy it here. Hold on one second. Ah, uh, let's do it manually. I don't know why I'm not getting right pace. Okay. So let's do this. Okay. So first, um, we are going to NAN this value and this value in binary. Okay. So what I like to do is I like to AND it first and then I NOT it. Okay. So I wrote it down here for you. So when we end any input with a zero, we are gonna get a zero. So zero and one is gonna give you a zero. I'm a little off here. Okay, so I start with that first. I end them together. One and one is gonna give you a one. One and zero is gonna give you a zero. Zero and one is gonna give you a zero. One and zero is gonna give you a zero. One and zero, oh, zero and one is gonna give you a zero. One and zero is gonna give you a zero. So once we have the result from the and, we, after that, we're gonna operate the not. So we simply invert them. So if we have this as the result of and, we not it, the first zero on the left here is gonna become the one, second, is gonna become the one, the third zero is gonna become the one, fourth zero is gonna become the fourth one. And then the next value, which is a one, that's gonna become a zero. And then the next zero is gonna become a one. The next one is becoming a zero. And the last one on the right, the least significant bit, the zero is gonna become a one. So the output of that is this, okay? Now you can use your, your programming calculator, your calculator to be able to, to find the result, but keep in mind that on your exam, right? As we use lockdown browser, I don't, there's no programmer calculator, just a scientific calculator. So understanding how to be able to derive the result is important, but we can streamline the process checking our answer using the calculator as well. 
Okay, any question on A? So I, I incorporate this just to jog your memory. We touched on this first week, but since we talk about logic gates this week, right? And we're talking about using, a, you know, not and, not or, you wanna be able to know how to be able to get the result from the input. The next you can do B. And so in B first, I'm gonna copy this. Are we doing this so that we can do two's complement, you know, like subtraction? Um, we are doing this so we can understand how um, Nan and Nora are used as logic, okay? In subtraction, you're only doing, you're only flipping the bits and you add the one for the complements and then add it again to the first input. So in the not and as we covered the De Morgan's law, we want to expand on how we how the computer derived the not and, right? And then when you apply the the nan, right, it gives you the negative or. So this is would be a negative or of those input. Okay. So in solving B, we first and them together. Okay. Make sure I took that underlying here. So we was, I would start with this value for the sake that I we type left to right, but the computer treat everything from right to left, okay? So we're gonna end the first value that's gonna give us a one. One and one is gonna give us a one. Zero and one is a zero because you have one zero as an input. Next one and zero is a zero. One and zero is also a zero. Zero and zero is a zero. Zero and one is a zero. And zero and one is a zero. We're not done. So because it's a not and, we would then apply the not. And we flip, invert the bits here. So we have a zero, next is a zero. When we not the zero, we're gonna get a one, another one, another one. So two, four, six, right? Okay. So this is the output of the not and. And this is just the work, okay? So we expect to know how to do this also for quiz and test. Now, similarly, um, we are going to have the, the C, we're gonna do the or and the not. So we would take those input and we OR them together. So anytime in OR, anytime you have a one, your output is a one, if you have a one as an input. So when we, when we OR one or one, you're gonna get a one. Zero or one, you're gonna get a one because this one has an input, right? Zero or zero, because they're both zero, you get a zero. Zero or one, you get a one. One or zero, you get a one. One or zero is a one. One or one is a one. One or zero is a one. And then after that, because it's a not or, we have to invert the result from or by applying the not operator, then we would get our result. So you flip the bits, the one here becomes a zero, next one becomes a zero, zero becomes a one, and then the rest of the ones, because we flip the bits or invert them, we get zeros. 
so that's your result. Question. And then you can do D on your own as you sh I show you how to do C. So you or them, get the result, then apply the knot by and invert the bits from the result to get the answer. Question. So at the simplest level, we would know how to produce the answer for not or not and, okay? As we touch on how De Morgan's laws apply. Okay, so coming back to the earlier section of the notes, we had talked about what a decoder is. And we define a decoder as a digital circuit or a circuit that changes the code into a set of signal. And how it's called a decoder is that it reverses the encoding. Now encoding system, we can use different encoding system. And when we program this week, right, uh, you would see, right, most of the time for programming, we see UTF-8. We have ASCII. We would see ASCII in our lab this week. So it's simply a circuit that changes your code into signal. So your smartphone, when it changes your voice, right, as wave sounds, is actually decoding the analog signal into your digital signal before it transfer it over the service provider network. Because all the networks are supporting digital format only, right? Landline, as you can see back in the day, and if you do have landline, it's still using digital network today. But in the, in the 80s and 90s, we use landline with analog. And this is why we would use the modem. And the modem, it modulates the signal along with encoding and decoding the signal. Okay. So for you know, the older generation like me, when we would need to use a modem to connect to the internet via the phone line, right? So it would take that, your computer data, which is in digital, convert it, right? And transfer it over the analog line. Now with that, you would, you know, sometimes face losses. We, we face loss and interference all the time. When you have a bunch of cables together, you have interference. Uh, you know, like for example, if you have at your desk, you have a bunch of things connected together, um, cables together, devices together, you have interference. But for the analog format transfer over time, we didn't get quite the speed that we want, right? Because of the technology that we were using back then. And now what you see is you see that things are transferred in an optical level where it would be much faster in digital format. So we have more consistency, speed and reliability. Okay. 
question 4A. So next we're gonna describe the purpose of the multiplexer. And earlier in the notes, we defined that the multiplexer of the MUX, it can be digital circuits for high-speed logic gates. And it's used to switch digital or binary data. They can either be analog using transistors or just digital, okay? MOSFET or relays to switch one of the voltage or current input through the single output. So you would have multiple inputs through a single output. And if you clip it from the notes, that's fine. Just make sure that you understand what it does. Next is gonna be number 10. So here we need to explain the purpose of the binary adder, the full adder in digital logic structures. And we, we learn what the binary adder. Okay, so Tyler asks what MOSFET means. Okay, here, let me find that one second. I'm gonna stop share real quick. We'll get you the definition, sorry. In chapter two, it touches on different type of MOS and MOSFET. So MOSFET is the, the later technology that comes after metal oxide semiconductor, okay? I thought I had put that in the notes, but I didn't, maybe I forgot to include it for you. Okay, I did. Sorry. So on page one, your metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. So MOSFET is just a type of transistor. This was, um, this was designed, right, to be part of the architecture. So overall MOS as transistors, they're just designed a specific way with the, you know, the materials to be able to apply the logic. So here, this is the difference between MOS and MOSFET. MOS is gonna use P-type and N-type, where MOSFET is your, your, it's still a semiconductor transistor, but it's for field effect. So this was earlier implemented. This is later implemented, okay, in the ISA architecture or in the microprocessor in general. I'll add this and modify your notes so I can define it a little bit more so it's clearer for you. Okay, so I'll upload it tonight or re-upload it tonight for you. But the chapter, you know, explains like the transition and the history of this a little bit. So make sure that you go through and read the book. Okay, so for 10, it talks about your binary adder, your full adder. In binary adders, they are arithmetic circuits. And binary adders would include half adders and full adders. These are used to add two binary digits. So for example, a zero added to a one, right, which gives you a one. Your combinational logic circuit, which is constructed with logic gates that would allow the values to be added together. So what are the logic gates you're in, in the binary adder? It would be the AND with 
the exclusive OR gates. So your binary adder circuits is consists of your AND logic and your exclusive OR gates. It's okay. All of the, a lot of the new terms in this particular chapter. So that just gives you a little bit of uh, brief explanation there. Okay. So your binary adders consist of a half adders and full adders. And they're simply, right, is a combinational circuit that's made of N and exclusive OR gates. So if you refer to the notes, it gives you the breakdown on which is which, right? How it's used to add and carry. In 11, we are going to describe the difference between combinational and sequential circuits. So, so far we've talked a lot about combinational logic circuits. Okay, here we're gonna to touch on sequential circuits. So a combinational circuit, it's always gonna give you the same output for the given set of inputs. This is why it's used in your adders. So the adder always generate the sum and carry regardless of the previous inputs. In sequential circuit, it stores information. It really output depends on the stored information plus the input. This is why your your state machine is, is using sequential circuit. So a given input might produce a different output depending on the stored information. So an analogy for this would be that if you ever visit an amusement park like Disneyland, okay, you purchase the, the park entrance ticket perhaps they give you a handband, right? And when you put your handband into the scanner, it's gonna read that and it's gonna activate, it's gonna turn, it's gonna rotate, right? The, tur the turnstile wheel to let you in. And you see this in a lot of things, right? You scan it and then it's able to go in. Or if you use a vending machine, that's a state machine. When you use a vending machine, you input your money or you use your credit card to buy something from the machine. And so as you input your money or your credit card information, for example, to activate that purchase, that action is occur, it changes that state and it's rotating, right? The little coil in the machine to drop that product. So it's a state machine. So your sequential circuits this way, it stores the information based on the input. And it really depends on that information in order to give you the, the next step, which is the output. So as I insert the dollar, it recognizes that it stores that information and it says that now it's gonna dispense a soda based on what I have entered into that vending machine, which is a dollar. Okay, so this, when is it used? It's used to really build memory elements, okay? So when you change the state of that machine, it's gonna give you, so different state is gonna give you different outcome. And your computer has this element as well, right? So for example, when you download an application, 
that is going to be added to the memory or the storage. And so it changes that state where now it includes that application. So whenever that you use your computer, you can go back to that application and you can run that application. Question. Let me find the slides that also has this. Hold on. Maybe not on this. Okay, question 12. So as we touch on sequential circuit and, and it's really a way to really build your memory elements to add to the storage. And in, in this class, what we would see is we would utilize when you program, when you create variables or when you use register, you using memory, you using the storage, right? So when, when you initialize that variable, you're just putting the data into that storage location, which is a memory address. So when I define my variable int, right? Let's say purchase is my variable name. All that is, is you putting a label or an identifier and tie that label to a memory address. So now when I, when I initialize that variable in C++, I say int purchase is, $30, right? 330 is integer. Then what will be is that that value, that data is now, right, in binary, is stored at that location and it's tied to the identifier or the label. Okay. But with the processor, it's using register, which is a temporary storage. And it uses the register to be able to move, right, things around. So I can utilize that variable at one point in my program and not be able to and not use it in the later part of my program. It's going to flush that out as it move it into the arithmetic logic unit and operate with the logic gates already and then, you know, store it in another location. So it's never in the temporary storage 100 percent of the time. It's always going to push that into RAM, right? And then whenever it needs to something for execution and it's gonna pull it from the temporary storage, it's gonna put it there, use it, bring it out. Okay, and that's what we do. So an element in the storage is called an RS latch. And this is a simple storage element. R stands for reset or clear, which is where it would put it into a set zero. And S is used to set when the element is to one. So how does it know if a certain things is stored in a certain location? Think of these as like flags or indicator that when it's not there, it's gonna reset or go to zero. And when it's there, it's gonna activate that and turn that into a one or set. And it's simply using a bit indicator to be able to say that certain value is at a certain address. So RS latch really is to, to let the system know that the storage is full or it's not. Okay. And as you are storing your data into different storage, like your SD card, your flash technology, your USB, even your SSD, right? Dynamically writing, that means that it's just gonna put it to the next available location, which is an address in that memory array or in that storage array. And it really, the processor, how is it gonna determine where is it gonna throw into the storage location? is it's gonna to refer to an element, which is what we would see here.
Now, back in the day where hard drive is not, or storage is not writing dynamically, right? It would be sequential where it would just store continuously, where it would be limited very slow. So it would fill up and then continue to fill up after that. Now, when you're rewriting data, or let's say I delete a file, okay, all that is is making that location become available for something to write over it. Data doesn't get deleted 100%, okay, unless we zero out all the bits. Okay, so when you delete a file, that file doesn't necessarily mean that it goes away, right? When you put it into your trash can or recycle bin, it just makes that location or that memory address become available for other data that you might write next. Question. Trying to find. Okay, so let's look at your multi-bit representation and how we would denote this. And in the textbook, it shows you this also on slides, it shows you this, but I wanted to show you how you would read, right? Your, uh, you, you would denote your bits, okay? Because later on, when we start working with, with you know, the, the assembly code, you have to know that certain instructions, right? So like your opcode is where in, in your byte, okay? Which bits, okay? So here, what the way that we denote it is gonna be, we're gonna look at it from left to right because the least significant bit is on the right-hand side. This is bit one, okay? And as we proceed to the left, right? So zero, this is one and then two and three and four and five and so on. I'm sorry, this is zero. <clears throat> so zero and then here we're gonna get 15. So when I highlighted this, all that is is here is your bit 10. So how do I know it's bit 10? We're gonna start with zero and we're gonna count up. And this is where Let's say that our data, right? This is this is where we're gonna look at bit 10 to bit 15. So the way that we indicate it is that we're gonna put it that range of the bit into square bracket. And on the left side, that's gonna be bit 15 because in a word, there are 16 bits from zero to 15. So 15 here, from the left and then you put a colon that will be to the 10. So if I'm only looking at these front bits right here, that will be from bit 10 to 15, but we just write it the other way around, 15 to 10 from left to right, okay? So with those bits, these are the values. That's the highlighted zero and ones, okay? So the, the notation here, all that is is indicate the position of the bits in that word. That means that at bit position 10 to bit position 15, this is the value. So when we look at opcode, it will tell you that it's gonna be the first four bits, okay? So what does that mean? That means that it's gonna start at bit 15, then gonna go down to 14, 13, 12. So 12 to 15 is gonna be for your opcode in assembly LC3, okay? Everybody clear on how we would denote your bits? OK. 
Okay, let's do B. So now I wanted to know what this range of the bits would be in your word, okay? So starting from the right, that's gonna be your bit zero and you just count up and we're only gonna look at the highlighted one, right? So zero, one, two, three, four, five. So I'm gonna go from bit five to bit zero and the value is the highlighted value. Yes, but you don't necessarily see that across because um, you know we don't always chunk them up into four, but if it helps you, you can space it to make it a little bit more visible. So when you see binaries, it will just be a group of binaries like this. So in the simulator, it will not chunk it into four bits for you, okay? But if it's easy for you to see, okay, then you can, you can do it that way to help you see better. But on the test, I would give you something like this, and then I would ask you to select, right, the right denotation for your bits in that word. Okay, and so you have to know how to read and which value it is. So from bit five to bit zero, this is the value. Okay, so if you know that the right side is the zero, you just count up and then look at the position of that bit. That's it. And the way we write it, we're gonna go from left to right, even though the computer reads the lowest is on the right side. So, Professor, would we always be given the range to work within? Or is that something yes. we would have to also? Oh, okay, cool. Because when you look at uh, the simulator this week, you will see, and I'll show you, right? It's going to show a bunch of zero and one. So when you build your, your, your assembly program, when you assemble your program, it's going to build. Because in C++, we, we have the compiler to do that for us. Now, at the low level, we have to tell it to assemble our instructions and data, and then so what it's gonna do is gonna create three things, your object file, your hex file, and your binary file. Because the simulator, the way they design it is to show you what that you know, what your program looks like in binary, what your program looks like with hex, what in memory, right? What your program looks like at our level with assembly language, okay? So sometimes you have to refer to, let's say I'm looking for a value A, right? Which is 10 in decimal, at a certain bit. So I have to take a look at that range to and quickly see, is that going to be equivalent to an A? And that's why we spent that first week converting binary and decimal. So we would see, because humans, we see everything in decimal, but the computer, it's going to say, oh, there's A at bit, this bit to this bit. Okay. Okay, so Samantha said, I'm still confused on how to do 13 A and B. I can't wrap my head around it. Okay, so Samantha, this is your binary. And I'm only interested in the highlighted area, okay? So I asked you for A is what bits is that highlighted value? That's the question, okay? And we have to write it down from which bit to which bit is that highlighted value. So how do I get 10, right? If we start with zero and we count up for each of the bit, we're gonna land here, the beginning of the highlighted, that will be 10. So the next is 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So for the highlighted value, that value is at bit 10 to 15. So the way that we denote it as we type left to right, right, we would say bit 15 to 10, that's gonna be equal to this value, the highlighted value. That's all I'm interested in. Is that clear? Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right, so the next one, I'm only gonna be interested in the teal highlighted value in that word, right? I care about what this is only. 
So just like the other one, you're going to start with bit zero. You count up one, two, three, four, five. I stop because that's all I care about now. So as we go from zero to five, we would write five to zero is equal to the highlighted value. And, and there's a purpose in this madness, right? We wanted to make sure that you know how to look at a certain value in the range bits because it could be endless, right? So we would know, oh, at that position, that value is equivalent to this in hexadecimal or decimal. All right, then for C, I'm only interested in these bits, okay? So again, we're gonna count zero, one, two, three, four. So it start at four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So we would then say that it is 10 to four, right? And that's gonna be equal to the highlighted bag. Because in a word, right, as I mentioned, when we work with LC3, there's your opcode. And then depending on the instructions, you know, the rest would be either a label or a value, like, you know, uh, a number. So when you initialize your variable in C++, it simply have an opcode, right? And then you would then use your register to add that value. So if I say int a is three, okay? So I need to add three to that variable to make sure that that variable stores three. And that's how LC3 works, assembly works. You add, you introduce that value by adding it or loading it. The compiler did that for you, but now you have to do it manually. Okay. Question. Let me highlight it in purple so you can see that's my answer. Question, no questions. Okay, so last question in this, and we're almost done with the session now. So for 14, it asks you to describe the property or discuss the property of the finite state machine. So here are some of the things, right? It consists of finite number of state or finite number of states consists of finite number of external inputs and outputs. It would have explicit specification for all state transitions, right? Depending on what will be the input, it would yield different output. So if you have a finite number of state, that will be finite number of external input and output. So the an explicit specification would determine the output value, as I just mentioned, this is often referred to as a state diagram. So your input would trigger the state transition, just like what we talked about with the vending machine, right? Your input of the dollar trigger, trigger the transition of that state, where now it would be dispensing the product, rotating, the, 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 the spring and dispense that product. If I don't have an input, nothing changed. So therefore the output that associated when, with each of the state or transition, it would use a combinational logic. 
to determine what output for the next state. So your combinational logic is used to determine the output for the next state because the output is always associated with the state, which is triggered by the input. And that's the finite state machine, which contains finite input and output. So the state transition at each of the clock cycle and its state is then being maintained in the storage. So it has to store the state in order to give you the output. So as we insert that dollar, it registered that do dollar, store that information, right? It's triggered for the state transition, turn the coils, dispense the product based on that input. So the last point is that your state transition, it would be for each of the clock cycles. Okay. So here, that would be the end of your unit two assignment. Make sure that we save our answer. If you're using other than PC or Word document, make sure that we put the PDF up. I will get your grading done from prior week this week um, as we have the holiday yesterday. And then, um, so I'll update grade weekly. I will try to at least, sometimes things do get a little crazy. Um, so, but if you're finished with this, you're welcome to turn it in now, or if you want to wait until, you know, closer to the end of the week, but it is due on Sunday as always. Okay, if you want to take a look at the assignment a little bit more or watch the video a little bit more, I'll release the recording tonight. Um, I have recording from last year, but I always update the recording when I can to um, just make sure that we're on the same page, especially with live lecture. Okay, so I do have a few minutes. I just want to pause and ask if you have any questions for me. If not, I wanted to give you a little bit of heads up on what you need to do with the lab. And then we'll do the lab together next time. We don't have zeros right now. Yeah. Back up to nine. Okay. Yeah, so I will update your grade so that way it doesn't show all zero as you submitted those. So yeah, you have you have various updated grades. So um, and the next week I'll work on this week's stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, as you are preparing for the lab this week, take a look at lab two documents. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the session and last time. Um, if you're using a PC or Linux, you can download the simulator application. Um, when you install it, sometimes if you have an antivirus like Norton or something like that, it might block it from installing. So if that's the case, you might have to change the setting of your anti-malware to allow that executable, okay? And when you install it, it's gonna put your LC3 folder on the C drive, unlike the other applications. So it's nothing fancy, okay? Also, do you need to always use the editor to type your code? You don't. You can use an IDE or a text editor like Sublime, okay? So in the case where let's say I have Sublime, like this. And Sublime can be used, you know, to write program in C++, Python, et cetera, it's just a text editor, right? You can also use Notepad. The cool thing about using an IDE or a text editor like this is that it gives you the line number, right? 
So when you build it, and if there's an error, you can know which line it is. Now, the beginning programs have maybe what, 12, 15 lines, or even less, four lines. It's easy to fix. But later on, when you work on your project where it becomes 100 lines, 200 lines, stuff like that, then when you're running it and you're having issues with it, it's not exiting the loop, something happens, then you have to go to that line to fix. You can quickly use an editor or an IDE, in, uh, an editor in an IDE to do that. If you have Visual Studio Code, um, Notepad++, um, you know, any of those work, but assembly uses .asm file, okay? So you're welcome to use those, but the LC3 program, uh, the simulator program has an editor built in. Okay, so I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So after I downloaded the application and the page that you can go to to find the download is LC3 resources, okay, here. You can find the link, okay, for Windows here. Okay, look up, and I talked about this last time, but download the executable, install it. Use the default settings as you install. Once you download it and install, it's gonna be for PC, okay? It's gonna be on the C drive. So it's gonna put an LC3 folder on your C drive like this, okay? This is where you're gonna find it. There are two parts in the application. There's the editor. This is where you use to write your code and assemble it. It looks like this. It's, they simply take what you see in Notepad and then you know write it into an editor. So I can write my code, right? Let's let's say this is a test program, like this would be a comment. And then I can do like add r0 r0. And for example, decimal four, something like this. Okay. And then I would assemble after I'm done. So this is gonna assemble your program. Then once you have it assembled, it's going to give you these files. See how I have the lab file? So here's my program in ASM file, and I'll walk you through on how to do this. Once you assemble, it's going to give you a binary file and a hexadecimal file and an object file, okay, which is like this. OBJ. You then can simulate or run the program using an object file. So then after that, to simulate it, I would go to, let me go back to my LC3 folder. I would use the simulator, which says simulate. And then I'm going to show you what kind of look like. So I don't have anything here. My machine is in zero state right now. And you can always initialize it. I would go in and let me open the file. So let's run exercise one real quick so you can see. So what that does is you can see it at the instruction level, which line is which. Okay, these are all your temporary storage, your registers. Okay, and then if I run the program, See how I have a hello world? It's going to output it onto console. Okay. So this is what we would see. And, you know, as it ran it, it changes. See? So I load my instructions. I run it after I, I assemble. I load my, my, my program in. I run it and I would see the output. So this is what we're going to be doing this week. Now, for those of you who are using a Mac, right, there is an online simulator. A few, a few people, they put up the LC3 ones. You can use that. Um, that will be your, your way to simulate. I am aware that some of you don't use PC. So on this page, okay, um, there are a couple of them. You can find more, okay? And it looks similar to what you see. You have your registers here, okay? So your console is gonna output here.
and then you can assemble. They have a button. And then you can run. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit more about this on Thursday. So take a look at lab two. If you want some Head Start, read some, I put a link on there or a document that you can see on how to really use the simulator. It walks you through on how to do that. Um, as this language is taught in many university, Penn State, University of Texas, Stanford, you know, CSU, San Bernardino, et cetera. So what you're getting is, you know, just about the same with all the universities. So. Um, I'll show you how you can build your program. We'll practice and then we'll write various programs. So by at the end, you should be able to do recursive functions, all of the good stuff, whatever you could do in C++, you can do in, in assembly. That's what I'm expecting. Okay. All right. Type your name into the chat. I'll stick around for questions. Let me stop recording.